Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Denver Museum of Nature and Science at home. Uh, thank you, Alyssa, for kind of getting us all queued up here. I'm Kristen Uhlenbrock. I work at the Institute for Science and Policy, a project here at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, uh, where we focus on creating an environment for civil productive dialogue on policy issues involving science. And in my view, COVID-19 and this coronavirus pandemic really is a prime example of science intersecting with policy in real time. So we're thrilled for our June lineup. Um, we're gonna be discussing this month a whole suite of things. Um, so stay tuned for future editions in addition to today. We're gonna be talking about ethics. We're gonna be talking about myths and misinformation. Uh, we're gonna be giving you the latest innovation and in technology coming out of the state here to tackle the coronavirus. And of course, we couldn't be doing any of this without our wonderful partners at the Colorado School of Public Health. So huge thank you for them and helping us put this wonderful series together. If you've missed any of our previous episodes, you can find both a written recap and the recording. Um, we have a nice landing page on the Institute website, so I encourage you to go there to view past recordings. Um, that's institute.dmns.org. And before we get started, I just want to do a few housekeeping reminders. We've got a great audience here in Zoom, as well as those of you tuning in to our Facebook Live. We encourage you to send in your thoughtful questions along the way as our presenter is speaking today, and we'll collect those and filter those into a Q&A here at the end. So if you're joining us on Zoom, just go ahead and type those right into the chat feature. If you're joining us on Facebook Live, you can put your questions in the comment feature and we'll kind of aggregate those all together. And apologies, of course, if we don't get to your questions at the end, we always have so many wonderful questions, um, but hopefully we'll get to most of them. So I'm really excited uh, to start June here and today's presentation. Um, we're gonna be seeing some new aggregated data and analysis um, about how our social distancing measures have been playing out around the state, looking at it through different demographics and giving us some insight into how these stay-at-home orders are actually influencing our behavior or not, some could say. Um, so joining me today is Dr. Jude Baham. He is co-author on this new report. Some of you may be already seeing it in the news and media, um, but we're really, really excited to dive into some of it today. So Jude is an economist. He received his PhD in economics from Washington State University, and his research interests are at the intersection of public policy, human health, and the natural environment. He's currently an assistant professor in the Department of Agricultural and Resource Economics at Colorado State University. And he has a wide ranging interest in his research portfolio, in my opinion, uh, which focuses on wildfire management at the Wildland Urban Interface, WUI as I come to understand it, I think. It's a great acronym, Wildland Urban Interface. The impact of human behavior on infectious disease and management, which is of course very relevant to our discussion today, and natural capital valuation. So with that, good morning, Jude. Welcome and thank you for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um... Yeah, the, I mean, thank you for the introduction. I, I think you covered it. Um, and, you know, I'll just add that uh, I, yeah, sort of got into this topic uh, circuitously from, from thinking about fire and systems that change over time and space. And um, it, I uh, appreciate the opportunity to, to present a, you know, some of my work. Great, we're really excited to have you. Um, so why don't you kick off? We're gonna have about a 20 minute presentation here from Jude, um, and then we'll hopefully have about 20 minutes to answer your questions. So Jude, why don't you take it away with your presentation? Okay. Just make sure, can everyone see that? Yeah, great. Okay, great. Uh, so my presentation's called, uh, How Has Social Distancing Affected Colorado? Um, and what I think I or uh, what I want to talk about today is is um, a, a bit about the report that, that we released um, and and then I'm going to um, give you some updates. I've actually updated quite a few of the figures in there um, and 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 also uh, talk a little bit about the the data that we're using and how we're using it and and how we're trying to ensure uh, privacy and safety. So let's start with a timeline of, of COVID-19 in Colorado. Um, we see on March 5th, our first case reported in the state. On March 10th, Governor Polis declares a state of emergency and things moved quickly from there. Uh, March 16th, we, had, we saw restaurant closures. 
uh, March 23rd, school closures were announced. And, you know, that it actually came uh, a bit after spring break where most um, university students at least had, had um, gone home. And then on March 26th, uh, we have the stay at home order, which was, yeah, was um, the, the most strict policy put in place. Um, and, and what we can see over the timeline, this is a plot of new cases over time. And we can see that that curve really uh, started to flatten out. So there's certainly evidence that the, um, the measures put in place had some effect on disease transmission. Um, and now moving into late April, we, have, we, we go to the safer at home, not in the Denver metro area. That actually came a little bit later. Um, but what we can see is, is those, those policies had an effect and, and that um, current practices, and what I'll talk a lot more about social distancing today, uh, that that did appear to uh, reduce transmission. So that's a good, good story uh, to work from. Okay, so let me talk a little bit about SARS-CoV-2 transmission. This is the, the virus that, that, it, that causes uh, the disease. And um, you know, this is primarily through droplet transmission. So these droplets can travel uh, three to six feet. They can be directly inhaled by other people or they can land on surfaces, um, things that we touch um, or directly on, on humans and, and, um, and, and be shared and then other people touching uh, their faces, things like that can, can lead to transmission. Okay, so we quickly, as, as, a, as a whole country and world, moved to this idea or, uh, of, so, of social distancing, right? And, and really the idea here is, you know, we don't have a vaccine in place, so our primary mode to mitigate transmission is to try to reduce these contacts, try to reduce the instances where people um, transmit the virus through through either close proximity or close contact. So things like no, avoiding handshaking, um, keeping that distance, that really comes from that droplet transmission uh, literature. Working remotely, avoiding crowds, staying home. This I think is what, what I'll focus more on today because it's what we can measure with, with some of the data I'll talk about today. Um, but it also includes things like washing your hands. Okay, and so then the big question is why social distancing? And this figure, I apologize, it will continue to loop through so you'll get to see it a couple times. But I think the key takeaway here is viruses spread. Um, uh, well, we've heard a lot about exponential spread, right? And this is an illustration of why. So each one of these dots is a new period of time. And these are the, the lines of the number of people infected, right? And so the why social distancing is so we can break some of those linkages. Now, when they turn to gray, those are. Those are sort of people that may have otherwise been infected, but were not because of some distancing. Uh, and they give some examples here, like work from home, not going to a barbecue, things like that. Okay, so we can see that it, it can have a dramatic impact on the number of people infected. Okay, so what I'm gonna focus on in, uh, with the data that I'll talk about today is, is some evidence for the fact that we've reduced mobility across the state. Uh, and that, that appears to have reduced transmission, uh, but it has also created some economic hardship. Uh, and so this, the, this last point uh, is not really covered in the existing version of the report, uh, but I'll, have some, I'll, I'll show some data today to um, help us understand that. Okay, so let's just start with th this idea that mobile device data is everywhere. Um, the, these companies, um, have become, I, th I think, uh, famous or, or infamous over the last uh, couple months uh, because they have been using the, the data that they've been collected, uh, collecting on mobile devices to uh, try to understand mobility, try to understand the impact of social distancing. And most of them have public-facing dashboards where they, they show um, what or what their data implies. Um, so what, what we're gonna use or uh, focus on primarily is data from a company called SafeGraph. SafeGraph recognized early on that, that valuing with, with academic partners um, uh, is, is useful and, and helpful to them. And of course, to us, it's incredibly helpful for investigating the, the questions we're interested in. And once the, um, the pandemic started, 
they, they recognize that there are some products that they were not producing that could be really useful to, to uh, people like myself that are trying to understand um, mobility in the state uh, during the pandemic. And so th they, they um, share with us anonymized and aggregated data, and I'll talk more about the, the uh, privacy issues related to that. Uh, and it, it, uh, they, they primarily package it in two products, social distancing, which is a, a product that they developed in response to the, the pandemic, where they provide information about how long, uh, in, in the aggregate, for some geographic area, how long uh, devices are spending at home, how far they're going when they do go out and travel, things like that. But it's all, it's all aggregated, and I'll show you some versions of this. Um, and then another uh, data product that they produce is called Patterns, and this is Visits to Points of Interest. This graphic on the right highlights that they're, they've invested a lot in understanding physical spaces and, and then understanding uh, how to count devices that, that um, move in and out of these physical spaces. Okay, so I, I uh, want to start with, with privacy concerns. And, the uh, two primary ways that we ensure policy in this data is, well, and that, that you know, honestly, SafeGraph does, is it's anonymized and aggregated. So by the time it comes to my hands, uh, it's already been aggregated at some level of, of unit. So it's uh, either at what, what's called a census block group, which are about 1,500 people, or it's, it's at a, a point of interest, and it's just, number of devices that are uh, that are at that location or that um, spend time in that location. So I never observe the individual, you know, uh, do not observe uh, movements between locations, things like that. Um, and then lastly, the ability to opt out. The, these are, these are um, companies that uh, have software embedded in apps that, that you uh, likely use and download, and when you permit location services, you're permitting these apps to collect that data. Um, and now uh, all of our phones do have pretty sophisticated options to opt out of, of uh, certain data collection. And uh, moreover, you can, you can visit the um, uh, company's website and, and in a lot of cases, uh, simply opt out there uh, also. Um, but also to ensure that this, this data that, that these companies sell commercially is, is secured. We have a data use agreement where we are using it for uh, COVID-19 uh, related research, and we store it very securely on, on servers. Okay, so let me jump right into uh, some of the uh, metrics. This is an update of a figure that we've produced for the report where the blue line, well, I should say the gray line is the hours at home by day since January 1st, uh, moving forward. So what we can see here, this blue line gives you a sense for that trend. What you can see is from January, um, moving on, uh, time spent at home was decreasing. This is largely due to just natural um, or, or regular processes, I guess. Uh, early January, we're at home for holidays and things like that. Moving down into March, and this is, you know, the first case in Colorado was March 5th, so we start to see uh, behavior change. These vertical lines uh, represent some of those key um, uh, policy changes. So uh, I believe this is school closures, then moving on to um, stay at home order, and this is the removal of of the stay-at-home orders and movement to safer at home. So we can see that this, these policies uh, clearly uh, had an effect on mobility. More people staying home, and this curve actually undercaptures this peak right here. Um, but what we've seen since about mid-April, and, and with the relaxation of the, the um, stay-at-home order, that this mobility pattern is changing, and, and people are getting back to their, their um, uh, pre-COVID um, uh, time spent away from home. Um, now, that, that's not necessarily a problem, and I'll, I'll talk more about that in, at the, um, uh, later in the talk, because what these are are broad-scale 
uh, mobility patterns. So we're able to measure when and where people are coming into contact, but not the nature of those contacts, not if they're maintaining six feet of distance, not if they're wearing masks, not if they're washing hands, wiping surfaces. So all of those things can have an influence on transmission. Okay, and we can look at that metric. This is the same uh, graphic uh, and look at how that varies by counties in the state. So I just grabbed a handful of counties here. And, and I think what we can see is uh, counties like Eagle County, we see the same pattern, but lower levels. Uh, and that, that could be an artifact of the data. We're exploring you know, the, the difference in the data quality in urban and rural areas. Um, but then we also see counties like Morgan County that started with patterns very similar to Denver and then uh, have seen a, a less change. Now, the other thing I'll, I'll uh, mention here is this, this might not be necessarily a bad thing. I'm, I'm not trying to rate or score uh, any of these individual counties. The risk may have been lower here. Uh, so we might expect the, uh, less behavioral change. Okay, and we can also uh, look at the, these, um, these patterns by demographics. So I, I uh, wanna be very clear here and remind everyone that, that again, we do not uh, observe individuals. So what we do is a sort of statistical trick to try to tease out the patterns of these age groups. We classify these, uh, the, the unit of observation in here, which is census block group. These are areas of about 1500 people. Uh, all over the state. And, and if we, we can find uh, census block groups that have a high percentage of people in one of these age categories. So we choose 70% as that threshold. Classify counties, uh, whether they're over 70%, 15 to 29, 30 to 59, and 60 plus. And we can look at the patterns uh, over time within those areas. And what that what that pattern suggests is that the 15 to 29 year olds um, uh, maybe responded less than, than the other uh, groups. Okay. Now, uh, we can also do this by, by income. And what I think this data suggests is that uh, higher income households are, are, are uh, able to respond more, and I think this is largely driven by uh, working at home. So we see a lot more um, ability to work at home in, or have a flexible workplace uh, with, with um, jobs that, that tend to be higher income. Uh, now this picture, uh, I have two kids of my own. This picture is, is also suggesting that we might not be as quite as productive, uh, productive at home, but uh, we are at least staying at home. Okay, and then uh, one of the other figures I want to show is it uh, gets at this idea that that we we move across the state, right? A lot of us live in the state because we really enjoy the natural beauty and amenities, and and really appreciate the outdoor recreation opportunities. And uh, but those movements between counties can actually uh, promote transmission. So what we're seeing here, this is a map of the state on February 8th of this year. And we're seeing the, what I'm calling the net import index. But this is just, uh, if, the cell, if the county is blue, then more people leave that county on this particular Saturday than came into that county. And we can then move over time. We can look at March 14th. This is right before the, the, um, a, a lot of the policies started taking place in, in Colorado. But uh, April 11th, we're, we're right in the middle of uh, the stay at home order. And we can see that um, these faded gray lines, uh, faded colors, sorry, suggest that the, uh, you know, mobility, the mobility between counties really uh, slowed down. And we can see uh, that that's starting to pick back up. And this is 523. So this is the Saturday of Memorial Day weekend. We can see that there's a lot of movement. Um, so the, the red would suggest more people are coming into that county than are leaving. Uh, and we can see uh, Chafee County um, and some of these other counties that you know, are known for their um, beautiful amenities 
uh, we see visitation to those counties. And so that, that's uh, potentially concerning because it, it suggests that even if those counties have low uh, case counts right now, there may be people uh, visiting those counties that, that uh, are infected and they may not even know it, right? They may be these uh, asymptomatic cases uh, able to transmit, but uh, not, not necessarily feeling bad themselves. Okay, and we can also look at restaurant visitation. So this is one of the key metrics we're keeping an eye on as, as we start to open up restaurants across the state. Uh, you know, restaurants provide a, a nice venue for socializing. We, we value that interaction. Um, but unfortunately, th this close uh, proximity can also lead to transmission. And so what we see, you know, across the board now, the graphics are starting in March uh, and moving forward to uh, uh, May 26th. But what we can see is uh, restaurant visitation falling off uh, pretty dramatically, especially in, in counties like Eagle County, where a lot of the visitation was probably from outside of the county. Uh, and then that's starting to pick up as, as um, takeout orders became more popular and, and also uh, as, as, the, as certain restaurant locations started to open. Okay, so I want to return to our um, timeline of, of COVID uh, and, you know, again, make the point that, that transmission has fallen. We're seeing new cases fall, which is a good thing, uh, but that didn't occur without cost. Okay? And so I want to highlight a few uh, graphics, and I, uh, I admittedly uh, took these from uh, Opportunity Insights. Uh, you can see the web address below, track the recovery. This is small business employee earnings over time, and we can see that those have fallen pretty dramatically um, along with the, or, you know, moving in the opposite direction of the mobility patterns, of course, as we stayed home, we know a lot of um, businesses suspended operation and, and, and um, there, you know, obviously have been large uh, layoffs and, and economic consequences. So, that is starting to rebound a little bit, but uh, we're still 31% below uh, where we were uh, before COVID-19. And we can also look at consumer spending. Uh, we can do this across counties. So the gray line being Colorado, uh, at this point, 19% below uh, what the, the pre-COVID uh, average. Um, and we can see Denver County is even below that, but you know, this, this is not consistent across uh, space. Gunnison County, we see it uh, has already uh, rebounded. This, is, this data is on a bit of a delay, so um, need to update this soon. Uh, but we can see that they are at 5.1% uh, uh, above their pre-COVID average, which is a bit noisier, so um, that, that may change. Okay, so I wanna highlight a few limitations and then, um, I mentioned some future directions here. <clears throat> Mobility device data on our sample represents about five to 10% of the population. So it's just by no means a census. Um, we're not able to observe everybody. So all of these estimates that I've, that I've showed you, I've tried to simplify the graphics, but they have uh, uncertainty uh, uh, built into them. Um, so while mobility is rising, you know, the other reminder I, 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 or point I wanna make is that, that um, these interactions that we're capturing with the mobility data are a precondition for transmission, but they don't, they don't account for whether people are wearing masks or engaging in other protective measures. Um, now, one thing that we are actively studying and, and hoping to include in the next round of reports is to statistically analyze the impact of mobility on, on transmission to, to uh, really quantify exactly what role these mobility data or what they're capturing about the transmission process. Okay, so I will conclude now and just uh, state that you know mobility device data is now available to help inform policy. It's an incredibly useful new tool, uh, but we're still learning a lot about it. Uh, distancing has proven to be effective, but costly. I think that's what a lot of the, the uh, data suggests. Um, and then just a reminder that the pandemic is far from over. Okay, so we need to continue to exercise caution, and this can be in the form of um, staying at home, things like that, or just reducing close contact, wearing masks, uh, being attentive to, to the, the 
uh, public health recommendations. Okay, and then just a uh, side note that Arapaho Basin was able to uh, open under some limitations. And this is from uh, the other day, uh, suggests that uh, this, it, it was not um, uh, overly crowded. They, they were maintaining uh, social distancing. The, the visitors uh, were maintaining social distancing. And I'll wrap it up there. Thanks, Jude. I don't know about you, but I've been entering those lottery systems for A Basin to try to get a chance to go skiing. And I have um, not lucked out in any of the lotteries I've entered. So, <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm I, sorry to hear that, but I'm glad that they are uh, implementing that kind of system. <laughs> yeah, no, it looks great. It looks like there very few people are heading to the mountain and stuff. So, but I know people are eager. Um, if you want to go ahead and stop sharing your screen and we'll uh, go into Q&A and, and just a quick friendly reminder, folks, go ahead and continue to enter in your questions in uh, the chat feature or the comment box on Facebook and I'll try to work them into some of our discussion here with Jude. Um, so thank you. First of all, a lot to unpack there. Um, I think we can go in a lot of different directions, but we did receive some questions and, and I have some ideas too about maybe we can just start with some of the data, some of the clarification. Um, I think you gave a really nice high level overview, but um, you know, when you talk about aggregating the data, right? I think it was in blocks of 1500 people or point location. Um, could you talk a little bit more about that? And, and are there ways to aggregate the data differently um, when you get it from SafeGuard or wherever that name is? SafeGraph, yeah. SafeGraph, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll um, explain a little more and, and take that social distancing metric uh, as one, the, the time at home is one that I plotted here a lot. Um, the way it comes to us, yeah, is in this census block group. And these are our standardized delineations that come from the census. It's how they uh, break up the entire map of the US uh, to count everybody, essentially. Um, and uh, so what SafeGraph does is uh, they, they obviously see the individual level data, the, the device level data. And they calculate aggregate metrics. So this time at home measure, for instance, it, what they're reporting to us is for a given day, the median time at home of all devices in a census block group. So they're on average 1,500 people. We observe somewhere between five and 10% of people within a census block group. And so what, we're observe, what we get it, for that day is one number for that census block group. And then we aggregate that up to county. So what I'm presenting here, uh, or the state, uh, and I, I, what, what I'm presenting here are these further aggregations on top of what uh, SafeGraph is already. And you had mentioned briefly, but I know there's some concerns around being able to opt out, um, right? And, and so the data you're getting is anonymous, right? You, you made that really clear, but SafeGraph doesn't see the anonymized data. So they have very detailed specifics about individuals. And these are apps on people's phones, right? And so whenever they allow location services, it's allowing access to data. Could you just elaborate a little bit more? Because I know people have concerns about privacy. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I mean, frankly, I, I'm just communicating what I understand when I read and, and talk to their, their um, engineers. And um, from what I understand, they get it anonymized too, even though it is at the individual device level. It's not tied to a phone number. It's not tied to an individual. Um, so, and, and, um, you know, I, I don't get the impression that that's their intent. What they want to understand is, is visitation to, uh, certain locations, um, as, as a way to help, uh, companies maybe understand what their, uh, visitation patterns look like. Um, and so, yeah, uh, what, what I mentioned is, is what I understand, uh, from, their terms and, and policies that they are getting that data from certain applications. I'm not exactly sure what those applications are, um, but you know, I, I, I would expect that these are applications that we use fairly frequently um, and yeah, that, that ask to use your location services. Mm -hmm. I think I had seen in the latest governor's press conference and report coming out about kind of the number of COVID deaths that that nine out of 10 COVID deaths were those in the 60 and over age group. Is that correct? And then in your data, you saw some patterns broken down by age group. And um, I'm curious if there's any, you know what I mean, any insight you can provide into, you know, we have the younger age group really down here 
not staying as home as much as, but you also saw, which I thought was a little surprising, was that 60 and plus older age group was also not staying as home as much as that, that 30 to 60 age group. I may be getting the numbers wrong, so correct me there, but I don't know if you can provide any more insight into those different age demographics. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, uh, that's, that's a great observation, and, and you're right. That's what those, those lines suggested. Um, what, I'll, what I'll mention here is that from a statistical estimation standpoint, they're probably not different from each other. So we probably can't um, you know, rule out that, that they're actually, uh, that, that, that those lines don't lay you know, effectively on top of each other. So I, I, don't, I, I think we can, um, I think the evidence suggests that the younger age group line is, is lower, but the, the old is probably similar to the 30 to 59. And I think, um, you know, as more as we've looked at this data more and more, um, I think those the the uh, 30 to 59 uh, curve is really driven by people working at home, right? So spending large amounts of time uh, at their home office or desk. Um, and so, you know, the the if if you were to walk around your block, that would show up as time leaving home. Right, but that's not necessarily a, a bad thing. You know, we're encouraged to get out and and um, you know experience or you know get outside and, and exercise. Um, that's not necessarily uh, leading to transmission. So I, I I would make those two points that you know I don't think we're seeing strong evidence that the 60 and older category is is necessarily staying home less, and it could just be walks and things like that. Um, what about, I'm curious if you can look at kind of longer term trends with this, right? I think the data that you showed started in January, right? And mm -hmm. you started to see kind of, maybe it was winter, I don't know. You know what I mean? You saw this dip decreasing mm -hmm. and then we saw this rise again and then we're starting saw, saw, see, start to see this dip again, this kind of curve, sinusoidal curve. But I'm curious if there's like longer term seasonal trends, right? Like during spring or summer or other seasons when you know, people move around sometimes more or less that you're able to look at or compare to, or is that something for the future? Yeah, no, it's a great question. And I'm actually very excited uh, because SafeGraph just um, just um, calculated these metrics going back to January, 2019. So we can, we have a year of now historical data that we can compare. I wasn't able to integrate it here. This really just came uh, recently. Um, and so, yes, the next version of reports, we're going to contrast the seasonal patterns of last year with what we're seeing this year. Do we get any sneak peek preview here? <laughs> no, I honestly <laughs> haven't. I mean, if, if, if I created it last night, it would be on these slides. So I haven't even looked at it yet. I'm excited. To do That's that. great. Real time, real time here. Okay. Yeah. Um, was there something that surprised you about this data when you got it and you started to kind of unpack it and look through it? Like, was there something that really jumped out of you that surprised you? Yeah, I mean, I think the 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 dramatic shift that happened at very quickly as as the uh, <clears throat> pandemic um, you know really started to affect life in in the United States and in Colorado, uh, we see it pretty clearly in the data that people change their behavior uh, pretty dramatically. And, and I think, um, I, I, I guess I was surprised to see how quickly that all happened. And that, you know, the, the reports of, you know, the near empty streets and things like that, I think were, were largely accurate and, and bear out in the, in the data. Um, I, I think the other thing has been, um, you know, things like visitation to, I, I, I didn't show grocery stores here, but um, the, the data really picks up, um, you know, again, that, that phenomenon that, that we saw where uh, as people prepared for the stay at home policies in, in many states, uh, we saw a lot of visitation. Uh, so we saw visitation increase to Costco, super centers, um, grocery stores, things like that. Um, and I thought that was uh, really interesting because it, it picked up this, this feature of, of human behavior to prepare and plan. Uh, but unfortunately, from the public health perspective, we ended up putting a lot of people in, in a place together when uh, some of those people were likely infected. Uh, in a similar vein, we had a question uh, thinking about the rural communities and how farmers um, still are very mobile, right? And 
you know, it seems like you can maybe look at aggregated data for grocery stores and points of interest. How do you take into account some of that rural movement potentially um, or not? I know you said there's some challenges between maybe looking at the rural urban and some breakouts that need to happen there, but specifically someone was asking about farming. Yeah, well, I mean, I'll, I'll um, say just, you know, very honestly, I, I, the, the point of interest, you know, visitation data um, is fairly sparse and certainly wouldn't, um, wouldn't cover farming areas, things like that. It's going to cover places of business where, where people are frequently going. Um, now, the social distancing metrics, those time, you know, that time at home measure, things like that um, may capture that. But, but uh, what we do tend to see is that the sample representation is, is lower in these rural areas. And it's just, it's just population density. There aren't as many devices there. So for a given uh, census block group, there's just not as much information. So I, I put less confidence in, in the data in those areas. Um, but yeah, we are trying to find ways to, to uh, really try to understand what the true signal is in those areas. And, 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 and uh, sorry, I'll tack on to that. You know, the, the risk is low if you're going to, uh, well, if, as long as you're reducing contacts. So if uh, people working on a farm are going, uh, working outside, keeping their distance, operating machinery, things like that, that's not the same as, uh, you know, going to retail and touching things and uh, things like that. So, so I think the nature of that interaction is inherently lower. Uh, lower risk transmission. Mm -hmm. Could you talk about how this data and this work um, is filtering or influencing or being incorporated into kind of larger modeling studies too? You know, we work closely with Dean Samet and he's been doing the epidemiological modeling. So kind of how do all these pieces of these studies kind of fit together and, and, and how are they going to be helpful for informing policy decisions now and in the future? And then we add on kind of a third piece, that long answer, which is, is there something in this data that could help people to look about for resurgence um, and help us kind of any sort of prediction in a resurgence of the coronavirus? Yeah, so that's the great questions. And if I forget any piece of any part of that, I'll, I'll come back and ask you. But um, what I'll say is, I, so I actually am part of the state modeling team, the epidemiological modeling team. Uh, and we are, that's, you know, a high priority for us is to understand how these data um, uh, fit with the estimates of social distancing uh, from that report. So during the peak, um, or the not peak, but the middle of the stay at home order and, and even moving forward, we estimated social distancing was around 70%. Maybe that's fallen to about 75%. So what, what we're trying to actively do is, is try to understand how that estimate reconciles with this data. Um, and unfortunately, it's, it's a hard problem. It's a hard research problem. Um, I wish I had answers for you, but, but um, what, what we, well, what I can say is, is um, some of these metrics, not, not this hours at home, but there's another version. It's the complement to it, which is hours away from home. Uh, what we saw there is over the time from the pre-COVID time to the uh, middle of stay at home that we saw the reduction in uh, time away from home by about 60%, something like that. So um, that roughly corresponds, you know, just to, to ground our, our social distancing estimate. What I will say is the, the social distancing estimate in the, uh, in the, in the epidemiological report um, does account for all of our behaviors. So maintaining six feet of distance, wearing masks, things like that. It's a, it's a composite measure of of all of that sort of thing. And it comes out of, of studying the, the uh, hospitalization and, and the case data. Um, so what we're trying to do, actually one of my priorities this week is to try to understand which of these mobility metrics from the mobile device data um, corresponds to the estimates that we're getting from the other data. Now to address the, the piece about policy, um, I mean, this is an urgent question, right? If we can understand the relationship between the mobility data and transmission, then we suddenly have a leading indicator, right? At the moment, we, we can really only study about two weeks uh, prior because we, we calibrate that model to uh, hospitalization data. 
and just the nature of the, the progression of the disease is such that uh, once you're infected, there's a, a incubation period of about five days, and then uh, people don't end up in hospitals till uh, many days after that, even if, if if they even do. And so, what we're what we're trying to understand is can this mobility data tell us anything about what might show up in the public health data in two weeks or so? Um, and I, I don't have a, a perfect answer for you now, but I think um, what one of the reasons this is challenging is the the piece that we can't measure here these small you know um, mask wearing six feet distance things like that um, those have changed over time so they're changing that relationship between our mobility data and these public out health outcomes and so measuring that and weighing those two uh, bits of information is is a, a challenging but interesting problem yeah, because there's lots of different measures, of course, that everyone's taking, you know, in place. And so it's hard to, to think about it holistically, yet individually, which behavior is influencing what. You mentioned masks, and I'm wondering, you know, do masks create this false sense of security? Yeah, uh, I'm not sure. Did, I don't, had you looked at my, my research uh, agenda? Uh, slightly. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, yeah, we actually have a working paper. Uh, that that studies that very question, um, and there's this idea in in the uh, economics and and the public health literature called risk compensation that we may uh, if if we if we're able to mitigate some form of risk, uh, then we may um, compensate that with other riskier behaviors. So some common examples are seat belts, right? We find that um, people end up driving faster. Uh, when seatbelt laws were implemented, um, uh, condom use and and sexual activity with transmission of uh, HIV, um, and so we asked a similar question in this case uh, that would do, does mask wearing promote a, a, a feeling of relative safety that that one is protected uh, and that because others are wearing masks, maybe it's safer to go outside or, or to engage in, in, um, in, in, in other social interactions. Um, and what, you know, unfortunately, a lot of the literature is, is questioning the effectiveness of the protection of masks, especially if not worn, you know, properly. Um, and so we wanted to understand if if mask wearing is promoting more activity, more social interaction, and the effectiveness of the masks aren't very high, what is the net effect on transmission? Um, or, and, and, and we're not exactly sure what that net effect on transmission is, but we, it does seem that when mask orders were put in place uh, over time and space across the country that people did um, end up spending more time outside. Or, you know, it, visiting certain locations away from their home. Um, one final question before we wrap up. Um, it's, you know, you just hinted on other states and localities. Um, are you, are there other people doing what you're doing for other states? Is there any sort of sharing of data in comparison of what's going on nationally versus individual states and communities? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so yes, there are many efforts uh, like mine and, and our, our modeling team across the country, um, you know, um, SafeGraph and, and these other companies are, uh, they're, they're producing these metrics for the entire United States and they're making that available to everybody. So uh, it's often useful to compare across counties to if, if we're trying to analyze the impact of a policy, what we do is exploit the fact that different policies come into place at different times uh, in different locations. And so that helps us, um, it helps, helps us isolate the effect of, of uh, policies. Um, and in terms of data sharing and communication, yes, I, the um, SafeGraph has actually started a data consortium uh, with over probably getting close to 3,000 academic partners and, and other companies that are, uh, have joined in the um, you know, effort to, to try to provide information and data that can be useful to combat this uh, COVID uh, pandemic. And so uh, there's a lot of interaction. There's a lot of uh, discussion about how the data could and should be used and, and um, you know, where are the, the uh, pitfalls 
uh, there. And, and so uh, it's a really active, uh, engaged community. And, and it, you know, everybody's trying to, um, trying to inform policy. And I guess the, you know, one of the other points I'll make is, you know, the effort to use this data is to, is, is to recognize that there are uh, significant costs to some of these policies like stay at home. And, and if we can use this data to understand how quickly we can relax those policies and get back to our normal interaction, uh, then that's, that's a, a good thing for everybody. Thank you. A great point to end on. We um, may have to have you back to talk economics here a little bit more in details in the future because it is, I know, front and center of everyone's mind as well. Um, we didn't get a chance to dig much into some of that data you showed at the end. So maybe we'll have you back because I know we've had a lot of um, interest in general around talking about the economics and, and the trade-offs and everything that come with all of these different policies that are make the decisions very tough to make for our policy makers. So um, that was wonderful. Thank you so much, Jude, uh, for all the work that you're doing, all the partnerships, all of your colleagues who are really kind of spending day and night, real time, trying to figure out how this is how this is impacting human behavior, what we can do to kind of keep people safe. So very much thank you to you and for joining us this morning. And hopefully um, our audience really enjoyed this presentation. Um, our next one is going to be on June 8th, uh, so make sure you all turn back in next Monday, 8.30 a.m. We've got a little ritual here. Um, we'll be ha having Alan Rudolph, um, who's the Vice President for Research at CSU, joining us as well. He's going to be talking um, about kind of the innovation and technology landscape in general that's happening here across the state of Colorado. And so we'll hear a lot about some of the cool stuff coming out of the research lab that's being applied here in real time to help us trying to uh, stymie this pandemic that's going on. So if you want to register for that um, or read any of our written recaps or watch this recording again, like I said, you can kind of follow all that on our Institute website. I also encourage you to follow us on social media. That's a great way to kind of stay up to date with the latest information. Um, the museum is uh, Denver Museum NS. You can follow the Institute on Twitter at Institute Sci Paul, and you can follow our colleagues at the Colorado School of Public Health at Colorado SPH. All of us are on Twitter. Um, I hopefully enjoyed today's presentation. I think uh, the human behavior and dynamic is really interesting, and it's a lot of our discussions here at the Institute is about kind of, you know, that human nature and human behavior and how information uh, can help influence or not uh, decision making along the way. And so it's, it's a really interesting, tricky uh, field, I think, that people work in. And we often wish we had answers as to why or how we or individuals act or behave a certain way. Um, and it, and it's, it's really hard and there's lots of factors into it. So I appreciate you spending some time trying to answer some of those questions. Um, it makes me think about, I think it was probably Plato, I think is what it said, uh, that you talk about human behavior and it's really about your emotions, your knowledge and your desires, right? That really influence kind of how you interact and how you approach things. Um, so with that, I'm gonna wrap up. Uh, thank you, Jude, for joining us. Thank you everyone for tuning in and hopefully we'll see you here next Monday at 8.30. Have a good rest of your week. Well, thanks a lot, Kristen. I appreciate it and thanks for having me. Thanks, Jude.